Look, I'd like in particular to welcome Harry this evening to talk to us. It's lovely to have you with us, Harry. Um, I just note from some of the bio uh, information that was on the, the information page that um, Harry Old Meadow was formerly the coordinator of philosophy and religious studies at La Trobe University in Bendigo. Um, his interests are very wide and fascinating. I think we might have to have you back another time, Harry, to talk about some of these other things here. Um, the perennial philosophy, mysticism, critiques of moder modernity, the spiritual encounter of East and West, environmental philosophy, and the primordial traditions of indigenous, indigenous peoples. And it's also published in fields of literature and cinema studies. And look, I'd like to welcome you, Harry. I look very, look very much forward to what you've got to tell us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for those... Uh kind words and uh, you mentioned the possibility of uh, asking me again which reminds me of Oscar Wilde's remark about Frank Harris the journalist Oscar said that uh, Frank Harris had been invited to every literary salon in London once uh, now before this talk uh, I had a quick look at the uh, blurb that I was asked to write Neville said, uh, you've got 300 words. We want you to tell us what you're going to talk about. Well, this was months ago. So, of course, one approaches this sort of exercise with reckless abandon, and I scrolled out 300 words, and I discovered reading through them that I'm really going to be talking about the history of the universe. I mean, uh, a ridiculous number of themes and subjects there, which would all be uh, good on their own. So uh, I've given myself far too wide an ambit uh, but I will try and touch on most of the things I mentioned in that uh, in that spiel. Uh, I might be kind of grasshoppering my way around and not alighting in any one place for too long, but uh, uh, just introduce some ideas, uh, some provocations. Some of you will probably radically disagree with some of the things I have to say. You may even get upset. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, a little bit of creative fiction, friction is uh, is all to the good. We don't want blood on the walls, but uh, a little bit of a frisson, a little bit of disturbance uh, is good. Uh, so let me start with um, a few quotes to just introduce a couple of very broad themes. Now here's. Here's a character called I.C. Jarvey. He's an anthropologist, I believe English. He wrote this a few years ago. I doubt if he's changed his mind, if he's still with us. Uh, so says Jarvey, man has made objective progress in improving his society. And we in the West seem at this stage to have the best society in recorded history. Well, that's very reassuring, Mr. Jarvey. Uh, Stephen Pinker, you know about Stephen Pinker, he's sort of American guru all the go at the moment, a kind of modern day Pollyanna. We live in the best of all possible worlds, Stephen Pinker tells us. There can be no question of which was the greatest era for our culture. Uh, the answer has to be today, until of course it is superseded by tomorrow. So we're, we're on this kind of upward climb Things are progressing, they're getting better and better. So, again, very comforting. Let me read you rather a different passage, uh, a longer one. Uh, I hope you can stick with it, it's worth listening to. This comes from the Vishnu Purana, a Hindu text, Hindu scripture, written more than 1500 years ago. Riches and piety will diminish daily until the world will be completely corrupted. In those days, it will be wealth that confers distinction. Passion will be the sole reason for union between the sexes. Lies will be the only method of success in business, and we might add politics. And women will be the objects merely of sensual gratification. The earth will be valued only for its mineral treasures. Dishonesty will be the universal means of subsistence. A simple ablution will be regarded as sufficient purification. The observances of castes 
laws and institutions will no longer be in force in the dark age. And the ceremonies prescribed by the, by the Vedas will be neglected. Women will only obey their whims and will be infatuated with pleasure. Men of all kinds will presumptuously regard themselves as equals of Brahmins. The Vaishas will abandon agriculture and commerce and will live there, earn their living by servitude or by the exercise of mechanical professions. The dominant caste will be that of the Shudras. So here we have a rather different picture. Uh, and uh, it strikes me that this passage written 1500 years ago is rather prescient. It seems to me to be uh, a rather graphic description of the condition in which we find ourselves. So I'll just leave those quotes hanging in the air for the moment. We'll come back to them presently. Now, the title of my talk, and I, I must pay some attention to the subject at hand, is The Spiritual Encounter of East and West. Now, uh, we're walking down the street, anywhere, Bendigo, Melbourne, wherever. And uh, our friend over there in the Lake District, probably the same applies. So we walk down the street, we pass a couple of Buddhist monks. We sort of notice a bookshop there and uh, look in the window, see a whole lot of books by the Dalai Lama. Uh, we think about going into a Vietnamese restaurant. Perhaps it'd be nice to just have a bit of a snack. We're going for a few spring rolls. Uh, we keep walking down the street. We see people doing Tai Chi in the park. Uh, we see people coming out of a yoga class. Uh, we think about whether we're going to keep our appointment with the acupuncturist next week, uh, and so on and so on. In other words, the East has arrived in the West. Uh, wherever we look, we see signs of the East of one sort and another. And this has obviously had an effect on our culture, which everybody's familiar with. Uh, you know, we eat Vietnamese food, Thai food, so on and so on. We know who the Dalai Lama is and so on. But the, uh, the question, the deeper question is, what does all this mean? And what are, what are the kind of ramifications of this interaction between the East and the West, particularly as far as religion and spirituality are concerned? Well, I'll get to that question in a few moments, but uh, let me just rehearse a few things which I mentioned in the blurb I wrote for this talk about how this has all come about. Well, um, that's a very long and complicated story. Uh, but just to mention a few of the landmarks along the way, some of the major developments, we're really talking insofar as there's been a sort of rapidly accelerating interaction between East and West, we're really talking about the last 200 years or 250 years. And some of the important developments there uh, were brought about by obviously, you know, the voyages of discovery and new means of transport and the development of European imperialism. So in Europeans wandering all over the world, plundering and pillaging. Uh, but some of them taking an interest in the cultures which they were penetrating. Uh, so, for example, we had the establishment of the Royal Asiatic Society in the late 18th century, which really inaugurated, uh, well, a lot of, uh, it was accompanying a lot of bad things that were going on, but some very positive things too. Also, for example, the development of philology and the interest in Eastern texts and the translation over the next hundred years or so of all of the great uh, Eastern scriptures, the Tao Te Ching, the Upanishads, the Analects of Confucius, and so on and so forth, uh, the Buddhist sutras. By the end of the 19th century, pretty well all of the major scriptures of the East were available in the West. Some of you may be familiar with the huge, heroic enterprise of Max Mueller in the mid 19th, 20th century, produced, a, I can't remember how many volumes now, dozens and dozens of volumes, the sacred books of the East. Uh, the Romantic movement was another important development in Europe. A lot of the Romantic poets and particularly the Romantic philosophers, uh, the Germans, especially uh, Schelling and Schiller and uh, Schlegel, uh, 
Schopenhauer, most notably perhaps, uh, these people all took an interest in Eastern philosophy in particular. And uh, this, this started a kind of uh, uh, inquiry that's been going on ever since uh, into the philosophies of the East, Confucian, Taoist, Shinto, Hindu, and so on. Uh, the transcendentalists in America, some of you will know something about, uh, Thoreau and Emerson and uh, Walt Whitman, people of this sort. Again, very interested in the East and uh, not only interested in philosophy and in the text, but in the actual practices of the East. So it's been said that Thoreau was the first Western Buddhist meditator. I'm not sure if that's true. I like to think there were some before him, but uh, he certainly had a had a had a uh, had a try at uh, a Buddhist meditation. Emerson uh, wrote this about the. I've forgotten now whether it's the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita, but it doesn't matter. The quote will do just as well either way. The first of books, he said, the first of books. It was as if an empire spoke to us. Nothing small or unworthy, but large, serene, consistent, the voice of an old intelligence, which in another age and clime had pondered over and disposed of the same questions which exercise us. Uh, then late in the century, we had Theosophy, Madame Blavatsky and Colonel Olcott and uh, all the gang uh, with their uh, ambitious enterprise, in some ways perhaps misguided, but uh, the hope of reconciling science and religion. And uh, with the Eastern religions, Eastern traditions to play an important part in this. Uh, the World Parliament of Religions in 1993 uh, in Chicago, where I was recently pleased to discover, I think it was Neville who wrote to me and told me about the participation of Swedenborgians uh, in the World Parliament of Religions, where they played a very creative and constructive role. Uh, coming a little bit closer to our own time, you know, we've got the mid, mid 20th century counterculture in America. Again, a lot of interest in meditation, yoga, Eastern practices of one sort and another, as well as in the, in the traditional scriptures. And the uh, Tibetan diaspora, of course, is a, is a major event uh, with the Chinese invasion and the exiling of many monks and nuns from Tibet and uh, many of them came to the West, not least to Australia. Uh, interesting that the Tibetan Lama said many years ago, back in the 1970s, in fact, that he thought Australia was one of the most fertile places where Buddhism might thrive in the West. And the biggest crowd that the Dalai Lama has ever addressed uh, was in Melbourne. So. Uh, Buddhism has, has uh, struck a note, struck a chord here in Australia. All right, now all of this interaction between East and West, as I said earlier, has produced sort of obvious cultural changes. It's made us more aware of religious pluralism. Uh, it's played its part in what Mercia Eliadi calls the deprovincialization of Western culture. Uh, in other words, it's opened up Western culture from being a sort of self-contained cultural universe to one in which we're much more aware that Western traditions, Western culture, the contemporary situation in the West is only part of the picture uh, and that we need to take into account the rest of the world and with a bit of luck, hopefully if we have enough humility, learn something uh, from the rest of the world, whether it's Tibetan Buddhism or North American Indian uh, tradition or whatever, uh, new opportunities present themselves. Now, to return to the big question, uh, oh, of course, also I should just mention uh, that the East is, the East, the Eastern thinking has had a, big impact in particular areas 
of Western thought and culture. Uh, so just to mention a few of those, psychology is probably the most important and obvious one uh, with the kind of infiltration of Buddhist ideas in particular, Eastern ideas in general. Philosophy I've already mentioned. So, you know, many of the philosophers since the people I mentioned, the early romantic philosophers and so on and the transcendentalists, this, this has continued. Nietzsche had some sort of interest in the East. Heidegger had quite a deep interest in the East. Uh, there's a lot of contemporary Western philosophers who are engaged with uh, Eastern modes of thought. Uh, physics is another one. Some of you might remember if you've been around as long as I have. I've passed the biblical allotment, ladies and gentlemen, three score years and 10. I've passed the biblical allotment, so I've been around for a while. Those of you who are also nearing or passing the biblical allotment will perhaps remember uh, Fritz of Capra's book, very popular in the 1970s, The Tao of Physics, in which he tried to show some of the convergences of the ancient Chinese texts with the latest discoveries, in inverted commas, of the new physics and all of that, you know, quantum physics and string theory and so on and so forth. Uh, fortunately, Capra didn't make the mistake, which many people in this area make, of saying that modern science verifies the ancient Chinese scriptures. Not the business of modern science to be verifying the ancient Chinese scriptures. Uh, not at all. That, the ancient Chinese scriptures don't need verifying. Science has got nothing to add. Science would be much better off saying uh, something along the lines of, well, gee whiz, hasn't it taken us a long time to catch up with these people? That would be a more appropriate way of thinking about it. Anyway, onward we go. Time marches on. Um, so earlier I flagged the question of what is the kind of deeper meaning of this East-West encounter? Uh, now to answer this, I need recourse to a few thinkers with whom some of you may be familiar, but quite possibly you're not. And I want to read a quote, first of all, from Ananda Kumaraswamy and then one from Rene Gainon. These are both perennialists, people belonging to a kind of particular school of movement. Uh, and it's from that movement that I take my bearings, so to speak. So Kumaraswamy, first of all, East and West imports a cultural rather than a geographical antithesis. An opposition of the traditional or ordinary way of life that survives in the East to the modern and irregular way of life that now prevails in the West. It is because such an opposition could not have been felt before the Renaissance that we say the problem is one that presents itself only accidentally in terms of geography. It is one of times much more than places. Now, I don't know whether you followed it all, all that and got a grip on it. So what he's saying is that until the Renaissance, Europe was a traditional world which had a great deal in common with the traditional worlds of the East. But since the Renaissance, there's been a kind of cleavage that the, the modern world is in some sense, at least an aberration, a peculiarity compared to previous times, places and cultures. Here's Rene Gainon. The outstanding difference between the East and the West, which really in this case means the modern West. So again, we're only talking about a recent period in, uh, in history. Um, the last four or 500 years. Uh, the only difference that is really essential for all the others are derivative is on the one side, the preservation of tradition with all that this implies. And on the other, the West, the forgetting and loss of this same tradition. On the one side, the maintaining of metaphysical knowledge. On the other, complete ignorance of all that is connected to this realm. So here we have a rather different perspective from that given to us by I.C. Jarvey and Stephen Pinker. And of course, there are many others of that kind to be found all about the place in the modern world. That is to say, these people don't buy the story of progress. Now, this idea of progress is 
absolutely fundamental. It is at the root of things. And uh, if I don't leave you with anything else tonight, I hope I can impress this on your minds if it's not already deeply impressed on them. So what we've got here is a view of time, a view of time, uh, which is idiosyncratic, peculiar, localized, and uh, characteristic of the modern West. And it's a view which has developed since the medieval period. There have been various components, uh, the Renaissance, man is the measure of all things, the scientific revolution of the 17th and 18th centuries, the so-called enlightenment, a complete misnomer, the triumph of reason, science, education, democratic governments, human rights, all of this, followed by various political and economic revolutions uh, coming down towards our own period when we've got these uh, kind of apostles of progress in various guises, uh, Darwin, Marx, Freud in a peculiar way, uh, these developments, these intellectual developments over the last few hundred years have really changed the way we think about everything. They've changed the way we think about time, about history, about society, about the cosmos, the whole natural world, about what constitutes a human being. Now, most people, most people, I don't say you individually, I have no idea, but most people in the modern world still believe in this idea of progress. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, all around us, we've got a vast, a vast array of things which should suggest to us that things aren't progressing. Uh, if anything, they're going in the opposite direction. They're getting worse. They're declining, they're degenerating. Now, of course, someone will jump up and say, oh, yes, but what about modern medicine? Or what about the fact that we went to the moon? Or what about the fact that you're talking on Zoom technology? Uh, what about all the benefits modern science has brought us? What about the fact that we can grow more crops? Uh, and so on and so on. So on. Any number of things adduced as evidence for progress. Now, of course, some of those things are good. No one's denying that. But it's a matter of taking a full view and weighing up what is good, what is most important, what is bad, and making a judgment when we've got the whole picture in mind. Now, of course, there are many possible starting points. If you take the GDP as the measure of progress, well, yes, we're progressing. If you take our longevity, how long we live as a measure of progress, yes, we're progressing. Uh, if you take our material standard of living as the criteria, yes, we're progressing. We can do all sorts of very clever things which people couldn't work out before. But what if we take the view that what is most important is our spiritual welfare, our spiritual awareness, our awareness of our inner nature, our, our awareness of our human vocation, of what it means most fundamentally to be a human being. Have all of these developments helped us in this regard or have they hindered us? Well, I myself, ladies and gentlemen, have no doubt about it at all. No doubt about it at all. They have hindered. They are so many distractions uh, from the business at hand, which is I take, I take the business at hand to be coming to a kind of self-knowledge, a knowledge of reality, a knowledge of our spiritual nature, a knowledge of the truths which have always been true and which have always been known. People a long time ago didn't know that E equals MC squared or whatever that preposterous formula is. No, they didn't know that. And they didn't know how to build computers and talk on Zoom. They knew something more important than that. And for all of our sophistication and for all of our so-called progress, all of our inventiveness, our creativity, our technology, medicine, all the rest of it, that has come at a cost of a kind of spiritual 
awareness and a spiritual knowledge. I think, I know some of you won't agree with me and that's okay. When I finish talking, I will finish talking, ladies and gentlemen. It will come to an end. It's all right. Just, just relax. I only got to go through another 15 minutes or so. And then I'll stop and you'll be able to tell me why I've got this story all wrong. And you'll also be able to ask me questions I can't answer. So that's something to look forward to. But I still have 15 minutes up my sleeve, so I'm going to keep going. So what's at stake here is two different views of life, of the universe, of reality. A view which used to be alive in the West, but is now more or less lost. And the traditional view, which is rapidly being destroyed and fragmented and corrupted and diluted in the East, but which is in a much better state than what's left in the West. Now, the various possibilities arise. One possibility, and I see symptoms of this all about the place, is that the Eastern spiritual traditions, the wisdom traditions and so on, will just be assimilated into Western culture. They'll be commodified. They'll put, put through the churner and they'll be turned into something comfortable and familiar. Example, well, Buddhism is just psychology. It's just a, it's just a psychology. It's a sort of rational psychology. It's nothing religious about it. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, um, doing some meditation and so on and so forth. Just a psychology, just another rational kind of view of life. Uh, this is a very alarming possibility, I think. Uh, I just use Buddhism as an example. We could choose many other examples, but you, you, you see what I'm saying. The, the yeast can just be sucked into the Western machine and kind of churned out the other end and it's gone. Effectively, it's gone. Or the custodians of those traditions can fight to keep the tradition alive insofar as that is possible, possible in a Western environment and that poses certain difficulties, certainly not an easy task. At the same time as people in the West take the view that we have something to learn from these Eastern traditions and the same applies of course to Indigenous traditions. Uh, that we have something vitally important to learn and that if we don't learn it, yeah, the show is over, just a matter of time. Uh, we're just moving towards uh, a doomsday, you know, whether it comes with a bang or a whimper, I don't know. Does it come through, you know, environmental desecration? Does it come through viruses? Does it come through atomic wars? I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities. But I myself, uh, not being a Pollyanna like uh, Stephen Pinker, don't take a sort of rose-coloured view of the future. I think we're in a perilous situation where as individuals and as a society, we have to make some very difficult choices. So the question is, where are we going to look for the answers? Where are we going to look for a better way of being in the world, a less destructive way of being in the world? Now, I could talk to you for the next many hours, if they were available, about why the world is in such a mess and parade you through all the symptoms of of this, but I haven't got time to do that. It's probably not necessary. But it seems to me that anyone that takes a cool, dispassionate, unsentimental view of the 20th century must come to the conclusion that this is the most bloodstained century in human history. Uh, people will start going on about, oh, you know, the Spanish Inquisition or Genghis Khan or slavery under the Romans or whatever. Of course, there are always abuses. There are always evils. That's human nature. There's no perfect society. But the question is, in what kind of society is the good maximised and the evil minimised? No one's saying there aren't good things about modern societies. I'm certainly not saying that. I'm not belittling the achievements of science and reason and education and all of those things. Uh, some of those things are good, but we have to consider them in, their, in the full context. And, of course, some of the things which we take to be good, if we look a little bit further into it, uh, well, things become a little more ambiguous. One of the things that people like Stephen Pinker and Richard Dawkins and all this crowd always bring up is modern medicine. Well, modern medicine, well, it's a complicated story. 
is it doing us more good or more harm? I'm not sure that the answer is entirely clear. And what about all the diseases that modern medicine is fighting? Where did they come from? Well, a lot of them came from industrialization. They're industrial diseases. People in previous times didn't get those diseases. Anyway, that's another story. All right, now I'm nearing my time. Uh, I want to say what I think the, the characteristics of a traditional civilization are. Uh, and so here I could be talking about Tibet, I could be talking about India, China, Japan, whatever. I could be talking about any part of the world until the last few hundred years, at which point we have to exclude the West and its various outposts in different parts of the world, like Australia. Uh, something different has happened there. But in all other times and in all other places and in all other cultures, these characteristics I'm going to give you apply. And you will, I think, notice that they are, generally speaking, conspicuously absent from the contemporary West. So first of all, uh, let me, let me uh, refer to a, uh, a symbol that's used by Houston Smith, one of the great writers about comparative religion. He likens life to a cross. So we've got the vertical arm, and we've got the horizontal arm. So the horizontal arm is time and space. Okay, we're in a time and space world. Things are located somewhere. They're in space. Time, time happens, moves forward or whatever. So we've got this horizontal plane. Everyone knows about that. It's, it's where we are. We look out the window. It's all around. You know, the natural world, all the things we make, we, we organisms, we're all part of this horizontal world. The material world, the only world in which science is actually interested, certainly the only world in which science has any competence, even there its competence is not altogether unambiguous, but let's be generous, let's concede that science has some competence on this plane, the material plane. But there's also the vertical pole of the cross, now, this is the spiritual pole. This is the spiritual dimension. This is the world, not the world, the reality, the reality that is not encompassed or imprisoned in time and space. It's the dimension that gives us access to something greater, something transcendent, something, something uh, not subject to physical laws the way matter is, the way our bodies are. Our bodies are something, you can see it here right in front of you, this decrepit old geriatric talking to you. Uh, the ravages of time are all too evident. Everything in the material world is subject to those physical laws. But is that all I am? Is that it? Is that the whole story? Well, if it's the whole story, ladies and gentlemen, you might as well go dig a hole in the ground and put yourself in it. Uh, there's nothing more to be said. I take the view, as all traditional philosophies do, all traditional religions do, I take the view that we have a divine nature. We have a divine spark within us. It goes by many different names. We won't get into a quarrel about that. No, no point in having semantic quarrels, whether we call it the soul, the spirit, Atman, the Buddha nature, the Tao, whatever, Brahman. Uh, we don't need to worry about the labels, but that is affirmed in all these traditions. Something we've lost sight of now and something that the sort of intelligentsia scoffs at. Oh, Freud, oh, consolation. You're just scared of facing facts. You don't want to look reality in the face. So you make up these preposterous stories. Religion is just a series of preposterous stories that give us consolation. Because if we if we were really brave enough, we would look around and we would see that this is all there is. This material world is all this. But we can't cope with that. So we delude ourselves with these childish stories about souls and spirits and afterlife and all of that. Uh, well, of course, I don't take Freud's view. So traditional societies have this understanding of what a human being is. They also have a sense of the sacred. They have a sense that there is something infinitely precious, infinitely valuable, ineffable, impossible to describe or to define, but there is a kind of presence in the world. And imminence is the sort of theological term, and imminence 
in the world, the divine in the world, which makes the world itself sacred, makes all living things in particular, not just living things, but living things in particular are sacred. They all have a sacred quality. Now, how different would the world be if we were taking that view of things? Would we be just plundering and pillaging and raping the earth the way we do, treating it as a cesspit, as a kind of sewer? Uh, you don't need me to tell you about the environmental despoilation that's been going on since the advent of industrialization. Uh, let me read you a quote from another perennialist, Frithjof Schuon. When people talk about civilization, they generally attribute a qualitative meaning to the term. In other words, civilization is a sort of good thing. We're all in favor of civilization. But really, civilization only represents a value provided it is superhuman in origin and implies for the civilized man a sense of the sacred. A sense of the sacred is fundamental for every civilization because fundamental for man. The sacred, that which is immutable, inviolable, and so infinitely majestic, is in the very substance of our spirit and of our existence. So, of course, if you agree with that claim, uh, as I do, uh, you then ask yourself a question, well, can we really talk about a civilization? Do we really have a civilization? I don't think so. If a sense of the sacred is fundamental to a civilization, we don't have a civilization. We've got an ant heap. We've got a kind of aggregation of busyness and chaos and noise and things happening here, there and everywhere. Uh, Terry Pratchett, the English novelist, progress. Progress just means that bad things happen faster. I'm inclined to agree with him. Uh, so, a view of the spiritual nature of the human condition, uh, a sense of the sacred, a, an understanding that uh, human beings have an unchanging vocation. It doesn't matter whether you're a person in the Arabian desert 600 years ago or a person in a Sydney high rise in the 21st century or whatever. We've got a kind of vocation, which is this, self-knowledge, coming to an understanding of who we really are. And uh, that's something that we find in all of these traditional civilizations. That human beings are capable of transformation. We're amphibious beings. We're like, uh, what are amphibians? Like uh, frogs. They sort of live in the water and live on the land. Well, we live in the, we live in the time space world. We live in the material world. But we also, if we're still alive, in anything more than just a mechanical sense, we also live in a kind of spiritual world. Um, and then we have a post-mortem destiny, another view that's held everywhere by everyone all over the world, except in modern Europe, by clever people like Richard Dawkins poo-poo the idea. Uh, we have a post-mortem destiny. Death is not the end of the story. What we do in this life will determine our post-mortem destiny, whatever that might be, wherever we might go. All right, now, finally, I think I've still got five minutes until I get to 8.15, which is my deadline, more or less. Um, looking at the religious landscape in the contemporary world, how have the religions, East and West, responded to the challenges of modernity, to this new scientific, materialistic, individualistic, democratic, egalitarian, secular, progressive view of things. How have religions reacted to this, East and West? Well, I think there are three, there are three very obvious trends, tendencies. Uh, and only one of them has got much going for it, in my opinion. So one response is fundamentalism, we kind of retreat into fundamentalism. So we see this in many parts of the world, obviously in the Middle East, in the Islamic world. Uh, it's raised its ugly face in America all over the place. 
uh, even more so in recent times. Uh, this kind of business where you cling on to certain beliefs, certain values and attitudes in a totally defensive kind of posture uh, and kind of radiating hostility towards everything else. We know what the truth is and everybody else is wrong. Um, a kind of simpli simplification, uh, a, a, a kind of uh, reflex response to the threat and the challenge of the modern world. Now, fundamentalism, you will easily have gathered that I think is a, a pretty ugly thing and a pretty dangerous thing. But I have to say one thing in its defense, which is that fundamentalism is largely a reaction to the threat posed by modernity. I think that threat is very real. So I think the sort of reflex uh, uh, response to this threat is intelligible, even though I don't like it and I don't think it's the right way to go. I have some sympathy for it. So, you know, even in fairly extreme cases, I can find, I can find a kind of, I can find a way of at least half understanding the way the people in question are thinking rather than just dismissing them as, you know, hopeless, reactionary, awful people who do dreadful things. Uh, you know, people like the Taliban, for example. Uh, I don't have much sympathy for the Taliban, but I've got some sympathy for them. Because what, what they see is a traditional world being absolutely torn apart and destroyed by modernity and by capitalism. And they don't want they don't want McDonald's. They don't want TV sets. They don't want the internet. And I think that impulse is not entirely wrong. I don't think it's entirely bad. So fundamentalism is one response, not a very satisfactory one, made all the worse when it is tied up with, as it so often is, when it's tied up with political reactionary nationalism of a very unsavory kind. Again on hideous display in America uh, with, you know, tele-evangelists and far-right spruikers of one sort or another. So fundamentalism is one response. Another response, more congenial, at least on the face of it, probably closer to where some of us are at, is liberalism. A kind of, well, anything goes. We don't much care what you believe, as long as you sort of do it in private. Uh, got nothing to do with public life, just keep this out of the way. It's a bit like sex, you know. Well, you do it in your bedroom amongst consenting adults, uh, but we don't want to know about it. Uh, that's the attitude of a lot of sort of highly educated people in the modern West. Um, within the religions, there's also this kind of liberal uh, liberalisation where anything goes, anything goes, you know. Uh, we find that there are fewer and fewer, the ground on which the churches, for example, are going to take a stand gets kind of smaller and smaller uh, because no one wants to offend anyone. Everyone wants to be tolerant. Everyone wants to be open-minded. Uh, and so uh, things which in the past were taken to be fundamental and enduring truths are now kind of relativized, which is another and other characteristics of modernity. Everything's relative, you know. Uh, Foucault and Derrida and all those clever Parisian oracles have told us that. Um, the third kind of response, which is much more helpful, uh, but not without its problems, is universalism, which is to say the sort of recognition amongst people who still have some spiritual intuition left uh, the, the uh, perception that all of the religious traditions of East and West and of, of the Indigenous peoples, they all have truth in them. They all have something going for them. They all have something to contribute. We can learn from all of these. And in its more rigorous kind of forms, universalism might even insist that there are certain metaphysical truths 
which are common to all these traditions. That's the view of the people, the perennialists I was talking about before, Kumaraswamy and Gainon and Shuan and so on. And that's that's the, excuse me, that's the view I take myself. Now, one final point, which is quite important. Some of you will have heard of Huxley's book, The Perennial Philosophy, uh, a very popular and influential book in the post-war period. Now, what did Huxley do? He went around and picked out bits of different scriptures and texts from all over the world, organised them under various headings, you know, morality, afterlife, prayer, et cetera, et cetera, and showed that there was a great deal of common ground between all the different religions. Uh, so far, so good. He then made a fatal mistake. He thought that what you could do is synthesise these common truths into a new religion, a kind of universal religion. Well, it wasn't a universal religion at all. It was just Vedanta in disguise, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. Uh, this is quite different from the view espoused by Kumaraswamy, Gainon, Shuan, and other people of this sort. What they say is, yes, there is a common core of truths. There's a, there's a sort of metaphysical core that's there in all the traditions. Uh, but the the response to that perception is not to say, well, we're going to have a bit of this and a bit of that and mix it up into a kind of universal soup. The thing to do is to locate yourself within a tradition. It doesn't really matter in the end which one. If it's an integral tradition, locate yourself there and commit yourself to that and do the practices, do the things prescription, do the things that are prescribed in that tradition by way of observance and moral codes and so on and so forth. So that's an important distinction between different kinds of universalism. Okay, uh, my time is up. I've talked, I think I've gone for four minutes past where I promised myself I would go, but that's not bad, is it, eh? Four minutes, that's not bad. You'll forgive me for, you'll forgive me for that minor indiscretion. Okay, it's time for you to open fire. I'm bracing myself. <laughs> I'm ready for questions, criticisms, discourses or whatever you uh, whatever you have to say. Can I say, Harry, thank you very much for your talk. I've very much enjoyed it and I, I'm interested to see what sort of questions come up too. Um, so I will open it up for others. We don't have so many participants, so perhaps we can give it a bit of a free for all for a few minutes and see what no. happens. Yes, Just certainly. Do be aware everyone of uh, the fact that your microphones are muted and um, just be aware of others and their questions. If we need to moderate it, we will, but I'll, I'll just let you um, go ahead and, and see if you've got anything to ask Harry. Well, I can't see a way out. Uh, yes. Is this Leo? That's yeah. Leo, yes. Yeah, I yes. can't see a way out. It doesn't matter which way I look at it, how I try to rake my brains. Yes. I think we're done for. Yes. Uh, is it a case of bring on the asteroid? Is, uh, that, is that what we have to hope for now? Bring on the asteroid? No, Wait, no, I wouldn't say that. that. I understand the point of your question and I understand where you, where you might be at personally. Uh, there are several answers that might be given to this. I'll just give you two. Uh, first of all, if we take the view of people like Gainon, uh, the world, the cosmos at large is actually moving through various cycles as it always has done. And this understanding is quite different from the sort of modern Western historical conception. The general view, and the, the, we find this doctrine of cycles everywhere. You can find it in, in Judaism and Christianity, although it's less prominent there. You can find it in Islam. Uh, you can find it in most of the Eastern traditions. You can certainly find it in the Australian Aborigines and the American Indians. Uh, and the view, generally speaking, is that, well, it's, it's, it's best put in the Hindu. They're the ones who've kind of elaborated the doctrine to its fullest the possible Yuga. extent. The Kali Yuga and all of that. Now, I personally totally believe in that. I believe, in, I believe the cosmos is going through cycles. I believe we're in the Kali Yuga. I believe we're in the Iron Age. And I believe this age will end in some kind of catastrophe. And I, I don't, as I said before, I don't know if it's a bang or a whimper. I don't know if it happens slowly, slowly, <laughs> slowly, like the frog in the pot of boiling water has got no idea that he's about to perish because the water's just getting hotter slowly or whether it will be some big bang. I've got no idea. But 
I agree with you if you're saying, well, there's there's not really any escape. No. I personally take that view. But does that mean we should throw ourselves in the hole in the ground? No. Because we are still human beings, we're still alive, we still have a human vocation, and we should do our best to follow that despite the circumstances. Uh, whatever the future may hold, we're actually here and we're free and we're responsible and we can do something. Now, we may not be able to prevent the ultimate catastrophe, but each one of us individually can make the world a better place mm. or a worse place. So what are we going to choose to do? Well, in the meantime, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss, yes. Yes, I'm all in favour of following your bliss. And hopefully, if you're following your bliss in the right way, you'll be helping to make the world a better place. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I think there's something to be said for a certain amount of grim realism uh, so far as the situation we're in is concerned. But at the same time, we have to accept our responsibilities and do our best to create good insofar as we can in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And it seems to me if you don't believe that, well, then, yes, you might as well give up altogether. I think that was a very positive statement. Yeah, that's Harold. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the only way you can approach it. We can't yeah. know the We can't know yes. the future. Yes, um, yes. The only thing we can do is to um, approach our lives in the best possible way here and now. Yes. That whatever we do, yes. um, we'll bring some form of improvement. Yes. Whether, whether that uh, stops the ultimate yes. catastrophe. Yes. I think it I believe it will myself, but um right. maybe I'm on the um the far the far side of this sort of a debate. But, um, well, I mean the theory of cycles does also propose that each cycle uh, comes to an end and a new cycle starts. So it's not entirely pessimistic. The, while we're in the Iron Age, it will be followed eventually somehow in ways which we don't understand by another golden age. Mm. Uh, so it's not entirely bad. Just on the question of cycles, I should say, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Said Hossein Nasser, he's an Islamic scholar and perennialist. Uh, I was at a conference once and he was asked about uh, the doctrine of cycles and he, he said, look, there's no point in getting too involved in all of that and trying to work out when all this is going to happen. That's a complete waste of time. We don't know whether the world's, if it's going to end, we don't know whether it's going to end in five minutes or for 50 years or 500 years or 5,000 years. We, we don't know and we, there's no way of knowing. So as Neville says, the best we can do is just carry on in the most creative, compassionate, uh, aware kind of way that we can. That's all we, that's all we can do. May I say something, please? Please do. I think we have to remember... Uh, some people don't like the word God because yes. of the past connotations of fear. Yes. Yes. Um, in yes. Catholicism, for instance, uh, it was all fear, hellfire yes. and brimstone. Yes. So perhaps I could say uh, the universal supreme intelligence. Yes. Uh, there is a power, a higher power yes. Yes. over us all. Yes. Now, if we get negative and, and be overwhelmed by all the fear and the negativity that's going on around us, we have to remember there is a higher power over all this and that yeah. we are spirit. We are a spirit. Yeah. And much proof and evidence has been presented for that um, uh, our consciousness survives physical death. You've only got to read Swedenborg's books. Yeah. And there have been wonderful people like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who studied thanatology. Mm. Now she yeah. researched thanatology and she went right into all the near-death experiences. Mm. Mm. And there have been wonderful people like Paramahansa Yogananda, mm. who mm. came from India. I think mm. he was Hindu, but a wonderful spirit. Mm. Uh, he came over to America to present self-awareness. Yeah. And... Um, so we've got to remember not to not to um, be in fear and be overwhelmed by all this. Yes, that yes, it, it yes. is in a high power's hands yes. and there's a purpose for all this. Yes. Look. And um, now what I'd like to ask, though, the question is, while materialism and greed and selfishness seems to be very prevalent, 
um, uh, materialism versus uh, spirituality, um, how would it be best to um, interact spirituality, uh, bring that forward? Well, well, this is a, this is a very tricky question. My people, uh, and uh, of course, a lot of people would disagree about this. But my answer to that question is that spirituality, spiritual wisdom, spiritual guidance, can be found in all these different traditions. Mm -hmm. It's no use looking at modern science for spiritual guidance. There's no spiritual guidance in modern science, mm -hmm. which is not to say modern science is a bad thing. But there's no spiritual light there. There's no illumination to be had there. Uh, so I think any one of the traditions, if they're real traditions, can provide us with a kind of path, a kind of way, a, a mode of understanding, uh, which would be which would be much better. Uh, but uh, that's not a very fashionable view. Uh, but that's that's my view. But to go back to what you were saying earlier, I entirely agree with you about not being overwhelmed by, you know, pessimism and despair and nihilism. I mean, life is a miracle and uh, mm. we, we are blessed to be alive. We're blessed to be here. Mm. Uh, we should have enough. I mean, what we're told in the modern world is that we're, you know, we've given various stories, you know, we're biological organisms, we're the product of evolution, we're socially determined creatures we're in some kind of you know the dialectic the dialectic of history Marx tells us I mean Freud tells us we're you know we're, we're all the kind of puppets of the puppets of the subconscious I, I don't buy any of this stuff I don't buy any of this stuff I mean there's some truth in all of these hypotheses and these theories but they're they're, they're really rather mean-spirited, squalid philosophies of life when you compare them with what we get in Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. Those are the philosophies that give us an adequate view of what the human being is, an adequate view of our situation. And uh, Are you serious But that mentioning uh, is Islam? Uh, sorry, who's, who's speaking now? Where are we? Leo, you, you mentioned Leo. Islam. Yeah, sorry, Leo, go on. You mentioned Islam as though it's yeah. some sort of you're giving it some sort of legitimacy. Yes, indeed, I am. Yeah, even even based on their behaviour over the centuries, how can you do that? But anyway, it's just of look. That of that's a very complicated story, and we probably haven't got time to go into it now. Uh, but the the picture of Islam as this kind of rampaging, misogynistic, fundamentalistic, violent, uh, hate-filled kind of uh, yeah tradition is entirely entirely wrong until very modern times and even in modern times only applies to a, a, a minority of Muslims I mean Islam just to give you one example it says in the Quran that all of the religions come from God and that we should have neighborly relations mm -hmm. and that Muslims should compete with Christians and Jews and everybody else they should compete in attaining virtue They've had the most conciliatory attitude to other religions throughout most of their history. Look at the way the Muslims treated the Jews and compare it with the way the Christians compared uh, treated the Jews. Yeah. The Muslims have got far less to answer for. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in general, they have been hospitable and protective and respectful of the Jewish tradition in a way that the Christian tradition, by and large, has not been. So... Anyway, as I say, we haven't got time to go into a, a, a long discussion about Islam and its history here, but I do think that there are a lot of misconceptions about Islam in the modern world. And Sufism in particular, as the kind of mystical branch of Islam, has got an awful lot to offer and got an awful lot to teach us. Uh, unfortunately, the Sufis are in bad odour under a lot of these fundamentalist regimes in the Middle East at the moment. And the Sufis themselves are being persecuted by uh, the Islamic fundamentalists. And this is a... Well, that's, that's sinful because the Sufis mm -hmm. are the highest branch of yeah, Islam that's, by that's, far. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's a, it's a tragic, awful yeah. situation. There you go. I'm going to jump in very quickly now. Thank you. Um, I'm just very conscious of the time. Yes, David. Does anyone have an absolutely pressing question they feel they must ask before we before we go this evening. 
No, that's that's fine. Um, there's um, opportunity always. Hang on, D David. David. Mark, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a question as such. I just. I'm probably about the only person here representing this strand of opinion. As some of you will know that I'm a skeptic and an atheist, and we're part of the modernist tradition. Not necessarily. We don't embrace all the crap that's gone down in the 20th and 21st centuries. We realise there's a lot to be done about it. But we don't share the vision of the universe which has been presented today uh -huh. at all. Uh, you know, you, you would probably classify us as materialists. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't believe that spiritual entities exist at all. We think that's a fundamental mistake about the nature of the universe. And th those of us I know haven't arrived at that point of view dismissively. I mean, I've studied philosophy, including philosophy of religion. I've known a lot of people who espouse these different traditions. And I respect them, and they all have much to contribute particularly on ethical front. Yeah. But we are in the position of having to deal with the world as we face it without any belief in the spiritual. And in fact, I find many aspects of Christianity and Islam in particular offensive. And I've written an article about this. I don't want to see them stop from, from being presented, but I don't like them. And I want to be free to say I don't like them. Yeah. And I want to be free to endorse a view of the way forward which involves science and analytical philosophy yep. and and if other people want to pursue it in other ways involving spiritual and metaphysical models of the universe that's fine as long as they don't expect to draw me into that or yeah. people like me can i ask you harry just to uh, respond to that quickly yes. i think I'll, i'm not going to permit uh, ask for any other comments because we are okay. going to drag this one on otherwise but uh harry I'll, I'll pass over to you okay very briefly uh mark was it mark was speaking yeah, yeah yeah yes mark okay i understand what you're saying um there are again a lot of things that could be said and i haven't got time to say them all but just a few points very quickly uh i too find many aspects of religion as we have known it throughout history offensive or difficult or unpalatable uh, and certainly not beyond criticism. I just mentioned one very troubling aspect of Christian history and that is anti-Semitism, uh, a, a, a terrible thing, uh, religious persecution and intolerance and so on and so forth. There are lots of abuses and evils. So I understand that. I also understand that there are many thoughtful people who take the view that you do uh, and who having considered matters and gone into them as you have have decided that uh, you know the claims of religion are wrong uh, and that there aren't any spiritual entities or powers or spiritual realities or whatever uh, that's all okay I hope we can keep talking to each other um, and you know, I, I, I know myself that I tend to get sarcastic and dismissive, but uh, about people with whose views I don't agree. But it's very important to hold other people's views with respect, to, to give everyone the space to speak. And this is true when religious people from different traditions are meeting. It's true when religious people are meeting non-religious people. Uh, for goodness sake, we, we don't want a situation where we all have to agree about everything and anyone who disagrees gets shouted down. We've got plenty of that cancel culture going on at the moment on the interweb and on the internet. And I, mean, I, I, myself, I myself was cancelled recently by the University of the Third Age. They would not let me present a paper about unbelief, which right. was, would have been subsequent to a series of papers presenting a series of different religions. Well, any, but, any yeah. anybody anybody who's got any independent views about anything is in grave danger of being cancelled one way or another mm. somewhere along the line at the moment and it's uh it's not a very happy or pretty situation and we anyway. sometimes have to we sometimes have to accept the freedom of people yes. from whom we disagree very fundamentally yes to express yes. their views yes my, my yes. views about christianity and islam go beyond what you've suggested i'm right. offended by the core of christianity thank, and the thank core you of I'm, I'm, still you know but it's, fair enough, it's so good that we can talk to each other. It's wonderful. Right, and we must keep that up.
I lost you there for a minute. Okay. We must keep, we must keep that up. Good on you. Good on you, Harry. Good stuff. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I, I do want to say thank you, gents. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. I'm going to hand over quickly to Matthew because uh, Matthew can tell us how to get a copy of um, Harry's book uh, for anyone who's interested. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. And also, um, lovely to see you, Harry, and great is to that, see you. Is that Laura? Yes, yeah. uh, Laura. Hi, Harry. Oh, hi, Laura. How are you? I'm good. good to see you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For those of you who don't know, um, Laura was actually the editor of Harry's most recent book, uh, Timeless Truths and Modern Delusions, which has formed the basis of what Harry had to speak about tonight. I will, in terms of anyone who wants to go into the um, material a bit further and hear uh, what Harry, what else Harry has to say, especially on things like the Kali Yoga and uh, other material he's brought up tonight. I will post uh, a couple of links just in the chat below. Um, but the book itself was published by Platform uh, Publications. So if you go to www.platformbooks.co, um, you will be able to order a copy of the book. Also, the book is on Amazon. Uh, as a paperback and as an ebook. So you're more than welcome to pick up a copy there. Um, yeah, but it was a great to uh, uh, see everyone tonight. Um, great to link up with the Swedenborg uh, community and also to put a face to the name of uh, both David and Neville. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, what I'll get you to do is uh, if you can forward those links to me, I'll make sure that they're distributed to anyone who's given me an email address in, in the booking. Um, the other thing I'll let you all know is that I'm going to, I'll send out a quick uh, survey, very fast survey to fill out just in terms of you know, what you've enjoyed about tonight. And if you're interested in any further um, activities and events in the coming year, and I'll make sure that those, those links mm -hmm. that Matthew provides are in, in that material as well. Um, um, David, before, yes, Neville. before we finish, yes. um, on behalf of the Swedenborg Group, I'd very much like to thank um, Har uh, Harold for the talk tonight. And it was really sort of some challenging ideas that I think were really positive, you know, to think about. Um, and uh, and um, I've been, uh, been sort of watching the screens and I haven't seen any blood on the walls. So I think <laughs> we've managed to uh, get through the evening quite successfully. But no, I really, really do appreciate it. I'm sure everybody present. Um, on Zoom would have appreciated it too. And yeah, I'd just yeah. like to make a sort of a virtual bit of a presentation. I don't know whether you can see this. Uh, yes. it's, it's a smallish book that we produced. I don't, I don't know whether you've seen it before, have you? No, I haven't. I haven't. <laughs> um, it was produced in Sydney by the Swedenborg Centre in Sydney called right. the um, Spiritual Unity of East and West. And it goes, the sort of subtitle is, um, oh, if I can find it. Can't find it now, but um, uh, it, as as presented in Swedenborg's writings, anyway. Right. That's right. It's so, a very promising title. So <laughs> hopefully that might be something you will manage to sort of read in your yes. remaining 20, yes. 30 years <laughs> in this, yes. in this yes. world. Yes. And uh, I should also let everybody know that um, just, just very recently, um, the International Association um, of Near-Death Experiences has released a video of um, um, Sweden, uh, Swedenborg experiences uh, in the spiritual world. Um, I think David's got the link to that. Is it? Sorry, just sorry. So, so, hold on, Chris. Sorry. Is it on YouTube? Yeah, it's on YouTube, the link to the uh, International Association for Near-Death Experiences video. David. Oh, yes, I can show it to you. Um, again, look, I'll, I'll post. Oh, that's shown the wrong thing. Um, I'll post. Um, it's just, it's just <coughs> come up um, in my, on my uh, feed uh, just actually about half an hour before I got on to, the, to signing in. So... Again, I'll, I'll make sure that that link is available to everybody in the information I send out after 
um, the meeting tonight, so you'll have, all have access to it. But it's fairly long. It's, you know, 25 minutes almost. Um, cool. It's only been published within the last 24 hours, and it's had 3,000 views. So that's pretty good as far as publicity for Swedenborg goes. So mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll make sure everybody has opportunity to, to look at that if, when you're interested. Well, Thanks, Neville. Good. All right, well, with that, okay. um, well, I think we're coming towards the end now. Yes, can I just yeah. say uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, been nice to be with you all and to meet you, so to speak. Uh, although I am in general a Luddite and have grave misgivings about modern technology, it does have some benefits. And mm -hmm. Zoom meetings such as this are one of those benefits. So we must make the most of the good things as well as putting up with the bad. So anyway, uh, I've enjoyed our conversation uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, flattered that you would ask me to speak and uh, I've enjoyed being with you. So thank you very much. Thank you too. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for being present. Um, very glad to see everyone here and uh, I wish you all a, a good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.